Hi, good afternoon, and thank you, Mr. Yu. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm the product manager for Safety, Respiratory, and Protection System in I'm based in Singapore. And I'm very happy today to actually share with you some of the filter selection guide uh, in terms of a general procedure for the respiratory filters. So before I start, I just want to highlight a little bit of remarks I have. For all aerosol and liquids, solid particles, gases, or even vapor mixtures, there are different types of contaminants that determines whether you need a particle filter, gas, or even combination for both. These are different filter materials available from Dragger and other manufacturers for various hazardous substances. And these are some, there are some selection criteria that is required to actually select the right product performance itself. So uh, the agenda for today, first I'll cover, cover the considerations when selection of the filters itself. Second, I'll touch on a little bit on the operating conditions and also what type of filter device and its maximum concentration. Then, of course, the last part is how do I select the really right filter for my respiratory protection? So considerations when selecting the filters. So um, the first and for all, it really depends on the ambient air conditions and conditions in the workplace itself. A filter device only offers sufficient protection if certain preconditions exist. If these preconditions do not exist, you have to use a self-contained breathing protection. The first part itself, if let's say the oxygen content in the air is at least 17% to 17.5%, depending on your local legislation, you all should be able to use the dependent on ambient air purifying respirators. However, if the oxygen levels drop lesser than 17%, you will need to use a self-contained breathing apparatus. Some other factors, including um, type of hazardous substance, has to be known, and that is a future material for this hazardous substance. The concentration of the hazardous substance is within the permitted limit for the application of the filtering devices. There is a risk for hazardous situation which may change. So for this situation, the filter device are considered insufficient. Some other factors that consider insufficient will be hazardous substance has a low warning characteristics, which means there's no smell or taste. Concentration of the hazardous substance are immediately dangerous to life and health. And the hazardous substance is not retained by the filter material. So uh, if you look at the table here provided to you, we classify the hazardous substance between dust and smoke, which can be filtered through particle filters, followed by gas and vapors. You have to use a gas and filters. So if you have the work situation that contains both particles, gases, and vapors, you will need to use the combination for both particle filters and gas filters. So uh, a quick poll question itself. Can I use a full face mask with gas filters in the confined space situation. So just a quick check for the card itself. Are we able to do it? So uh, based on the full result, you can actually see that um, there's still around 40% that actually agrees that you could actually use a full face mask in a confined space situation. However, the correct answer is really no. Um, the most important reason is that for full face masks with gas filters, uh, there has in a confined space situation there could be a um, situation that there's lack of oxygen. So if you use a full face mask with gas filters, it's not really recommended um, because it's not well ventilated and there's a potential of high concentration of contaminants and lack of oxygen situation. Go back to basics. Okay, so. What we really need to know is to check on the intended operating conditions in order to see whether we can use gas filters or particle filters. So the nature and concentration of the hazardous substance as well as the local working condition must be known. This is the most important criteria. The required protection factor for the filter apparatus, whether it's a half mask or full face mask, must also be determined. Filters and masks are seen as a single unit. They are not separate, and you have to really understand and go through the instruction for use, uh, supply the device thoroughly before use. So some of the general 
conditions that we really go through before we use the mask and filter in the intended work condition. Sorry. Um, yeah. So some of the conditions that we actually follow on the intended work conditions in the workplace is, is there any sufficient oxygen in the ambient air? We have to check with our local legislation. So example for Singapore, it's actually 17.5%. Uh, but in general, we follow the EN rule, which is 17% as the minimum volume. What are the different contaminants are there in the ambient air? What are the concentrations of the contaminants? And which form are the contaminants in? Example, gaseous or particles, or actually it's a mix of both. And next, we look at, do the contaminants have adequate warning properties itself? Example, do they have any smell or taste? And what is the applicable occupational exposure limits of the countries itself? And last, is there any additional personal protection equipment required for this respiratory protection? So, for example, if you do need an additional safety glasses, you actually have to actually test it and do a fit test to ensure the safety glasses do not affect the fit of the respirators. So, to answer all the questions on the previous slide itself, it will help to determine the potential factor you will need. So, but before that, you need to understand two different um, terms that we actually use for the market itself. So, the first term is actually nominal protection factor. So, what does NPF mean? The NPF mean is actually derived from the highest permissible leakage level for the respective device in accordance with the requirement of the application of the standard itself. It indicates the medically calculated maximum protection performance of the respiratory protection devices. The factor for the maximum application concentration is the practical recommendation in the regulation, which is derived usually from either yen or German standards, and we call this NPF. Um, the next we need to really know is what we call as the occupational exposure limit itself. The concentration and the limit value of the contaminants are required in order to determine the minimum protection factor. And this limit value is actually what we call occupational exposure limit of the substance. It is the concentration of a specific airborne substance that average over a reference period. It shows no evidence of the substance being hazardous to the one's health that is being exposed to. So at that concentration at a daily basis. So in all and all, we actually show um, there's a table on the end that actually tells you which type of mass and particle filters itself and what is the normal potential factor it has. So example, we have a full phase mass with filter and with a P3 filter itself, the normal potential factor is based on a thousand factor. But if let's say, we have to calculate on the maximum usage, we will only take 400 as the safety level itself. So over here, we will give an example. Over this, over this example itself, uh, you will actually see we can use that to calculate what is the protection factor we require and relate back to the table previously to see what type of protection mask that you require or the filters we require. So, however, do take, so you can, See over here, the minimum potential factor is 30 based on the lead dust as the example. You will need a P3 filter, either with a half mass or full face mass or a PAPR to actually reach the 30 level. You can't use a full face mass with P2 filter because it's actually lower than the non protection factor itself. And secondly, it's always important to know that in the event of contaminant is present as both gas and particles, the norm nominal protection factor must be established separately for each item. For the selection of the filter device, the higher protection factor must be applied. The concentration of the gas is measured in ppm, or usually we call it a parts per million, over or in uh, milligram per meter cube, which is the weight of the substance within one meter cube of the ambient air. And last is the concentration of the particle dust, also in uh, milligram over meter cube itself. As a, this type of this type of a calculation is actually used with volume and it can be directly convert from the milligram over meter cube to ppm. So example, 10,000 ppm is actually 1% volume. So next we will actually see an example over here, which we will determine the maximum concentration level. So previously we determined what is the mass type required. That is if we know of the concentration level, but for certain of 
some of the customers, they really want to know what is the maximum concentration level that we have. We could actually based on this example over here. So what we have over here is based on an example on the chlorine dioxide. So the factor for maximum concentration use of the full face mask is actually 400 factor based on 0 0.1 ppm. It's actually 40 ppm chlorine dioxide. But of course, as I mentioned, we need to take in the factor of particles as well. So which is 15, with a P2 filter, um, 0 0.1, that's actually 1.5 ppm. So we will always take the lowest possible concentration, which is the for the chlorine dioxide in this particular case, which is 1.5 ppm as the maximum permissible concentration. So you will only allow to win the worst place around 1.5 ppm. So next, I will share another example over here. So um, over here, the example, we have chlorine itself. So chlorine, we have the maximum permissible value of 0 0.5 ppm. We will use an example with a full face mask with the gas filter. But do take note that it is an IDLH of 10 ppm. So based on the calculation we gave earlier on and how we do the calculation for maximum gas concentration, 400 times 0 0.5, which is 200 ppm. The maximum permissible concentration for chlorine will be 200 ppm. So now I'd like to ask a question to all. Um, is this calculation correct or wrong? Okay, so this is the poll result. It's pretty much close as the previous poll is around 50-50%. Um, the actual calculation is correct in a way, but it's not allowed to be used. So I'm saying that there is an IDLH of 10 ppm. So what is IDLH, which we usually classify as a term of immediate, immediately dangerous to life and health. So the calculation, the filters are able to filter up to maximum 200 ppm chlorine. However, because of the IDLH properties itself at 10 ppm, we don't recommend to use it. So what is IDLH in the first place, we need to know. So we actually, it actually means immediately dangerous to life and health. Concentration level that poses an immediate effect on life and health of a person. So if any of the concentration above this PPM, we will actually recommend immediately use of the supply air instead of air purified. Because at any time, uh, once it's above the limit itself, it will pose a danger to the user itself. So IDH will be always a consideration to plug into when you do your maximum concentration calculation. Right? So last, how do I select the right filter? So uh, I just want to reiterate itself, contaminants come in different forms, such as aerosol, particles or droplets itself, gases or vapors. Depending on their occurrence, um, you need to protect yourself and oh, this form or even both. So usually what you see on the left side, the dust, mist, and fumes are what we call we consider as aerosols. So it's also including of microorganisms such as viruses, bacteria, fungus, and their spores, and the mist itself. On the right side, it will be gaseous substance. So once you know which type of um, state of the contaminants that you are protecting against it, you need to know what is the chemical itself. So um, usually we will offer our customers the EN classification of filters. So as you see, uh, we have the organic vapors, which we classify under A. And for gases that have boiling point, organic vapors compound that has boiling point that is less than 65 degrees Celsius, we will offer the AX filter. The difference between both of the filters is that um, the AX filters are actually reactor filter compared to the A filter, which is actually filtering away the gases. So the air filter, you could only use once per worksheet, depending on the organic compound group one or group two. It could be lesser if it's in the group two level. There's also B for inorganic gases, such as low concentration of H2S or hydrogen cyanide acid. E, which is um, catered for sulfur dioxide, hydrogen chloride. And the most common one, in a way, K for ammonia gases. We have special gases itself, such as um, NO for nitrous gases, 
CO for carbon monoxide. So these are some of the special gases that only available in um, the EN or DIN standards itself, which we offer to customers, and they are only one time use on a certain time limit. And of course, the last is have particles, which actually help to filter away solid particles or aerosols in the air itself. So filters, again, once we know the, the chemicals that you need to select for the right filters, it is even divide into classes based on their capacity or their efficiency itself based on particle filters. So class two gas filters may be used at a higher concentration or for longer periods of and a class one filters. The particle filters indicates the efficiency of the filters for the particles from the ambient air. For example, class one, 80%, class two, 94%, and class three, 99.95%. So I quote the example again. Um, example for the filter types based on the color um, coding itself is the A2P3. So this is suitable to filter again gases and vapors from organic compounds with a boiling point higher than 65% degree Celsius up to concentration of filter class two, which is uh, maximum 5,000 ppm. And gas and filters from inorganic compounds, which is the B, such as chlorine, hydrogen sulfide, and hydrogen cyanide up to concentration of the class two, which is also 5,000 ppm. And particles concent uh, up to concentration of filter class three. So next I'll leave talk a little bit difference between um, NIOSH and EN standards itself. So um, luckily for us in the ASEAN region um, or Singapore region, we are allowed to use both standards um, in accordance to the local allegations. But for some countries like in Malaysia, we will be following the EN standards. So one of the key differences in determining the difference between both of the standards itself, um, of course, other than the countries which you know NIOSH is from the US, EN is from the Europe region, is the approval type and the requirement itself. In general, um, the approval types for NIOSH itself is based on industrial style and they only tested based on path of fail. Usually on the quality that you fit yourself with no test report dedicated to the values itself. But for the EN, we actually using the TIL test itself in a test chamber, there is time inert leakage where you check on the different pass criteria on which is depending on the respirators. So it ref and the NPF reflects the minimum requirement of the protection factors. So then secondly is in the difference is in use. However, um, in the NIOSH, because of the testing criteria, um, they will need to use qualitative or quantitative fit testing which is with the APF that is used uh, with a safety factor of 10. But for EN, um, EN standards, you are not required for the fit testing. However, I just want to emphasize, however, though EN does not require any fit testing, it will depend on your local legislation whether any fit testing is required. So example for Singapore, even though you are allowed to use both EN and NIOSH, you were still required to go through a fit testing. This applies to um, some other countries, including Malaysia and Thailand. So um, that's a quick difference between the NIOSH and the EN type. So this is, will be the NIOSH filters itself. Instead of A, B, E, K, usually these are the common alphabets that we classify of the gases. They classify under OV, under organic vapors, AG for acid gases. OV, AG is a combination for both. And they also have ammonia, which is uh, equivalent to our K. But again, if you really look into the whole list itself, some of the gases are not included in for low concentration, including um, H2S, it's not including in the AG. Uh, usually, which we classify a low concentration for B in the EN. And they do not have special gases such as EO or NO, uh, based on the DIN standards, German standards. So, depending on really determining on your working concentration and what are the gases that you might face. If you have a very low concentration for special particle gases, you might be able to use a filter for a small period of time. So that's the difference between EN and NIOSH. Because EN sometimes does offer gases which is not available in NIOSH. 
Next, I'll talk a little bit on the particles. There will be a much difference between the particles testing standards and the grating of the particles filtration system between EN and NIOSH. For EN versions, we usually classify under P1, P2, or P3, based on 80%, 94%, and 99.95%. But if you look at the NIOSH version, they have a much um, wider standard in a sense. They test for oil base and non oil base, which the common one we know as N95, which is the lowest, which is the 95% filtration. So if you have aerosols that's actually oil based, you need to use R base, which is the R95 series. But for EN, Although we classify as P1, P2, and P3, all this have been in theory tested against oil based particles as well. So, uh, in theory based, it could be used if you determine the oil based particles is the correct oil based particles to filter it out. Okay, so I will talk more again for the particle filters in our next APR sessions, which I'll talk about disposal mass, which usually Focus for the N95, N95, and P2 or P1, which is really widely used within our region. I'll give a little more insights about that on our next uh, webinar session on the 25th of March. So I just want to really highlight some of the important notes itself. Um, the requirements is um, you must really observe this basic view. The rules itself is that. In an oxygen deficiency environment, we must observe the local legislation or at least follow not um, on the O2 level, which is 17% no lesser. So depending on country, some could be 17.5, depending on local legislation. But again, on the basic rule is 17%. Any, but any air concentration below 17% of O2, we don't recommend you to use a filter device. If you are in a poorly ventilated areas or confined space area, which we do the first four questions, such as container, tanks, small rooms, tunnels, or even vessels itself, you are not allowed to use the filter device. In the atmosphere where the content, contaminant concentration are unknown or even immediate dangers to life and health, like our second four question, we have the COVID, which is above the 10 ppm. We do not, you should never use the filter system. And if the contaminant concentration exceeds either the maximum permissible concentration or the filter class capacity, which is usually, if let's say you have a class two, if you have a contaminant that is around 5,200 ppm, you are not allowed to use it. Last, very important, in a way which is always neglected by most of the uh, user in, in the environment is, if the contaminant has poor or no warning properties, example, benzene, carbon monoxide or even ozone because they do not have the smell, taste and even the irritation to your fueling, you are not allowed to use the filtering devices. And you should leave the immediate uh, area immediately. If you have any breathing resistance increase noticeable, you start to feel dizzy when you use the mask, the filters, or even smell and taste or being irritated by the contaminant around uh, your working area, even though you are wearing the half mask itself. And lastly, if a filter device is damaged, you should leave the area immediately. So, um, oh, I have a first question. Is the OEL different in every chemical? Yes, so as you see on my slide itself, OEL difference varies from all different uh, chemical or CA numbers that we know of. So um, it's very difficult for us in a way to actually um, showcase a table that what is the OEL values of all different countries. Uh, but however, uh, we do like to recommend you to our website itself. We have what we call the Dragon Voice system. So this is link, uh, you can find our link at our Dragon website, uh, www.dragon.com. You can actually key in based on your country, like example, what we show you over here, Singapore, then that's, then we will automatically select the act for you. Uh, based on the Workplace Safety and Health Act, you can actually determine based on the P, they will call it the PEL, uh, exposure limit itself. The OEL will be determined over this part. So you could actually search for your own contaminants 
um, OEL if you have your own contaminants and you can do a check what is the OEL for the environment. And of course, um, lastly, a lot of, um, most of the time the customer will, I mean, the end user will always ask is that, how long does the filter last? Actually, the service life of the filter really depends on the filter class and the ambient conditions. There are a lot of factors that actually affect the service life of a filter. Example, concentrations of the contaminants in the ambient air, the composition of the contaminants, Next, the humidity of the environment also affects um, the service life of the filters. The temperature of the environment, which differs, especially a working temperature. And last, uh, which also neglected by a lot of time, the user is the breathing rate of the users. We have different users having different breathing rate itself. So you have a higher air intake, you, the, use, the usage of the filter will actually be faster. So it is really not possible to give an estimated service life as it is being influenced by so many factors itself. However, uh, we do know that you can actually know the end of the service life is recognized based on a noticeable smell or taste in the gas filters, the increased breathing resistance in the particle filters, or either one of it in the combination filters. So this is where we actually change out the filters. Or if you have a change schedule or respiratory program, you can strictly follow your respiratory program to change your filter. However, special filters that we do offer under the Yen on Dean version, like CO filter, it has to determine, determine based on the class level or what we actually mentioned, uh, like CO20, which is 20 minutes, or 60 at 60 minutes. AX filters, which um, it's a reactor filter which we usually use within one shift, which is maximum eight hours, depending on the gases itself. Some other common questions is customers will ask is um, reuse of the filters. We don't recommend the reuse of the filters. We have, for Dragon itself, uh, we do recommend single use of the filters at the time, unless you really need to reuse it if you really expose for a very, very short while. However, the filters can be reused um, within the six months after its first use if it is stored properly in between a sealed and uncontaminated air with correct climate. So what do we mean by this? We actually mean that once you use the first time, it has to be stored in the room with normal humidity, which is less than 90% of the humidity in Singapore, we are actually facing about more than 90%, sadly. The temperature has to be between negative 10 to 55 degrees, and the storage area must be uncontaminated. With that, um, you can you reuse it after the first open of the six months. Anything above the six months, you cannot reuse it again. Lastly, seal. When we say seal, uh, a lot of uh, users, they say that, Put it in the just a bag is sealed. No, um, if you especially using on the single filter, where we say sealed is you have to place with the original filter plug and filter cap. So, uh, the background picture shows the filter itself. This is actually the filter plug, and the cap itself has to be re um, enclosed in back up in order to ensure it's back and sealed so that the filter does not um, is integrated over the storage period of time. Obsession for filters like one-time use filters, AX, CO, and NO filters, they cannot be reused. It's always a one-time use because the base of the filters is as a reactor filter. They will react once they actually comes into the contaminants itself. So they cannot be reused again. Okay. So um, I just want to request you on the whole breathing portfolio for our air purifying protection. We usually classify from all the way from particle filters as the disposal mask, which we usually call it, or we sometimes we call it SFP, filtering phase pieces, all the way to half mask, between filters or single filters is available, and followed by full face mask, which comes with a full face visor. And the most extended will be actually our PAPR, which is the power air purifying respirators that brings the air to you with a much more better comfort itself. 
So available from Draga, we have the Explore 3300 and 3500, which is a twin filter basis. Um, it comes with both. We will offer the EN as a base, but if you have a requirement for NIOSH filters, those are available as well. It comes with both EN and NIOSH approval, and it's actually easy to wear and skin friendly, especially to our 3500. It gives a very good seal compared to a lot of our competitors' masks in the market, which is using a silicone model. Of course, we have our full face mask. Um, most of the time, full face mask is being used for single cartridge. Just for your information, for single use cartridge filters, if the filter weight is more than 300 grams, you will need to use a full face mask because if you use a half mask, the filter will actually drag down the mask and pose a danger. So any filters that weighs above 300 grams, you will require to use a full face mask instead of a half mask. Okay, so I just want a little bit short advertisement. Um, we'll be actually running a full series of APR webinar sessions over the next few months itself. So we will have a selection guide for the disposable mask for N95 and NLP. What are the differences and how do we select, especially in view of current pandemic situation in a way. Followed by April, we will touch on a little bit on the PAPR. What is a PAPR and is it really better than um, this, uh, the half mask or even full face mask once they actually use it? And of course, in May, we will actually touch on with the escape respirator for your emergency response plan. How to choose the right escape respirator? What are the different types of escape respirator device available in the market? Um, how do you actually weightage the pros and cons of each escape respirators? Okay, so I hope I have shared some insights with you today. Um, thank you. So maybe I'll hand over to Mr. Yu and we'll start off with the Q&A session. Okay, thank you, Michael, for sharing with us uh, the product knowledge on this uh, respirator mask standards. Right now, we're going through uh, our Q&A session, and we have uh, quite a fair bit of questions being raised by the attendees. And uh, I do encourage you all to continue to post your question as we respond to some of this that's been raised. Okay, let me go to the first one michael if you're ready maybe some of these questions yep. you also um, um, mentioned briefly during your presentation is oel different in every chemical yes oel is the legislation set on different chemical exposure limits different chemicals have different occupation exposure to the maximum um, itself. So example, you want to have a H2S that has a very low um, PPN depending on the countries, where you can have like COVID dioxide, which might have a higher occupation exposure limit. So OEL differs between countries and differs between chemicals. Okay, so perhaps uh, if we can, we will probably provide some link uh, when we summarize the presentation, all right? <clears throat> Yes. Okay. Correct. So Please. one of mm. sorry. Go ahead, yeah, so one of the way is yes, thank you, sir. One of the way is we will provide a link to our Dragon Voice website. Once you go, which we mentioned earlier on just now, uh, once you go to our Dragon Voice website, you can key in your contaminants, which they will let you know what is the OEL limit, and you can select based on your country to actually know the OEL limit of the particular country itself. Okay. Yeah. Next question, Michael. Um, yes, sir. Someone asked, how do we apply APL calculation? Okay. So, um, so we do show two different calculations earlier on. Um, the two calculation is actually based on selection of the mass or filters or calculate the maximum calculation. So if we are talking about APR calculation, which is the, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly, which is based on the NPS factor. So we will actually, what we actually use is, we will actually get off the concentration 
that we know of uh, in the working environment follow um, example uh, example if I know my working concentration at the workplace for for DAS is actually around three milligram per meter cube after the lab analysis test and I check on the OEL of the particular contamination. So example which I show showcase over as vaccination, the OEL of the lead dust is at 0 0.1 milligram per meter cube. So what I'm going to do is I will take the 3 milligram per meter cube divided by the OEL, which will give me a, the NPF national protection factor at 30, 3, 0. So with the 3, 0, I would actually based on the table which I provided earlier on, uh, you can base on the NPF factor anything Protect, any protection that's above 30, you are able to use it. Let's go back to the okay. slides. Yeah, so maybe I just go on to the table, if you don't mind. Okay, so as per what you see on the table itself, so like I said, um, if we have a 30, you can actually use a half face mask with filter on the FFP3 filter that gives a 50. You cannot use a FFP2 filter uh, or the P2 filter because it actually gives you a 10 protection factor itself. Same as the full face mask, you will need to use a P3 filter because you need to be 30 or above. So this is where you will calculate um, the protection factors itself. As for the next is actually depending on your environment, if you want to cal calculate what is the maximum concentration level that I can go to with my filters. So um, sometimes they know that they have example, I showcase over here, example like chlorine dioxide. I know I had need to filter against chlorine dioxide, but I do not know what is the maximum concentration. Am I supposed to use a mask and filters? So I will use my, the B, uh, B and P2 concentration, which is 0 0.1, based on the maximum factors of the maximum calculation, 400 times 0 0.1 and 40. And because there's a dust involvement, you will take 15 times 0 0.1, and we will take the lowest value, which is the 1.5. So that means 1.5 ppm chlorine dioxide is the maximum concentration that we are allowed to use. So these are the two important calculations that you need to understand to actually calculate the, what is the maximum concentration of chemicals that I can use with the filters and what is the mass type that I should use. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. In case uh, the questions are still not fully answered, please uh, also respond uh, with in the chat. Yes. Okay. I will move on to the next question asked. Uh, uh, one of the attendees, uh, Michael, is asking you to repeat the EN and NIOSH filter types again. I guess you have a slide okay. on that topic, right? Yes, comparing, is, is this a question comparing the NIOSH and EN, which yes, is the more stringent yeah. guidelines? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so... Uh, you have a slide that's showing the EN and NIOSH filter types, right? Correct. Mm. So um, this is the EN filter touch. And also uh, this is the EN, which is the A, A, X, B, E, K. And this is the, now you're stuck, correct. So I guess maybe I will, when we share the hand out, hands out to, up um, to the attendees, I will redo the slides in a, in a base of uh, comparing on the left side in the EN, on the right side is the NIOSH. Yep. Yes, uh, uh, for, for the benefit of everyone, at the, after the end of this uh, webinar, we will compile the information and the question and prepare the videos uh, the recording to be shared with the attendees. Okay, so you all will be getting a copy of this uh, recording uh a few weeks later okay uh next question mm. um 
Mm -hmm. What is the type of cartridge used to protect against welding fumes? What is the type mm. of cartridges used to protect against welding fumes? There is a, uh, okay. Usually we will actually recommend a P3 filter. P3 filter, however, uh, when, when user comes to me, when they ask um, for welding, what of the gases should I use? I will ask a question first, what is the type of uh, welding that we guys are actually face. Uh, so I give an example. I, I would, I will actually ask um, the customer uh, because again, uh, some of the welding itself uh, they might omit what we call the metal, uh, metal fumes or natural fumes that might require um, uh, organic vapors with um, P3 filters. So depending on the type of welding the customer is doing, we will offer accordingly. But if it's a general welding, general welding, we will actually recommend an organic vapor plus or a A2 P3 filter, usually. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Michael. The next question. How about the Baynard filter? Can it be reused? Because we mentioned the filters can be reused. Uh, was it single cartridge? Now the question is, uh, how about mm -hmm. the bayonet filters? Yeah. Yes, the bayonet filters have the same properties as the single filters. Uh, so the bayonet filters can be reused. Uh, however, the, the duration will be much more shorter. We usually we recommend we don't recommend to be reused. But if you really need to reuse it, you have to restore it in a zero bag. That means the whole mask and filters, you do not remove the bayonet filter if you need to. Uh, after cleansing up, then after that you put back into the zero bag that is supplied with the mask and the filters inside the zero bag to ensure there's no contaminants go into the mask and the filters itself. It can be reused, but uh, usually based on the capacity of uh, twin filters, which is relatively low, we will recommend them to be a single use unless it's required to be reduced again. Okay, thank you, Michael. The next question, which type of filters is suitable for areas that have CS2 gases? Which type of filters is suitable for areas that have CS2 gases? Wow. I'm okay. not sure, is this the yeah, right? Two. Okay. Uh, Usually we'll recommend, um, okay. The problem with CS2 is the CS2 has a very low um, melting point and boiling point. It's, it's not really low, but based on our vision, it's considered low because it's around 40 plus degrees, if I remember correctly. And because of the vapors it might emit, plus the potential that it might emit also fumes, I miss, so not, not film, sorry, uh, it's actually miss. So because there's a potential that's miss itself, so you will need to use the particle filters as well. So usually it will be a B, B2, B3. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Because we okay. do not know the, the disintegrate, how miniature the miss is. That's why we will recommend as a B3 filter. But okay. uh, if you are able to determine, it could be used a P2, but uh, from our side, it's a B3, yes. Hmm. Okay, thank you, Michael. Another question, comparing NIOSH and EN, comparing NIOSH and EN, which is a more hmm. stringent guideline? Notice their A, P, F are different. So comparing NIOSH and EN, which is a more stringent guidelines? Um, notice that their A, P, F are different. Okay. Uh, I cannot... I cannot give a answer to this, to be honest. Um, both testing methods are different. Both testing on the total mm -hmm. inward leakage are different. Both have their pros and cons in a way. Uh, my personal view in a way, um, I don't really think it's cons, but both have a uh, different testing methods. Uh, I would say both of the standards are very well tested and 
you could use either both standards in our vision as well. So there is no better or more stringent. It will, I will say, I can only say that both testing methods are different and both can be used depending on your acceptance level and what are the chemicals that uh, you, you are facing. So um, there could be some, as I would say, extraordinary cases that uh, you can use an EN, but you can't use an Anyosh. But other than some extraordinary cases, both are widely accepted and both can be used. So there's no which is more stringent, which is better. Okay, thank you. Okay, another question. What is the difference between normal protection factor and factor for max? What is the difference between normal fa protection factor and factor for max? Usage in your steps three. Uh, I think you missed the uh, explanation. So what's the difference between normal protection factor and a factor for max usage in your step three? Okay, so let me just go back to my step three, if you don't mind. So is, is my slide moving? Uh, yes, you are now at step three. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Okay, so um, so that's actually two tables I show you over here, the MPF factor and the factor for maximum usage itself. So um, let's just cover off the normal protection factor itself. So this is actually factors in, it can be only achieved if the respiratory device is used and maintained correctly. In accordance to the instruction for use, and you choose the right size, and you only wear the device when clean shaven as the facial hair in the seating areas can cause leakage. So the values is being taken from the EN529 report. For all these values are taken for the EN529 report in order to reach all the maximum uh, protection factors. This is actually what we call a conservative factors for maximum usage. That means uh, we will usually use this to do a calculation based on the conservative part. So you can see it really matters is actually when you talk about full face mask with filters where we actually drop off uh, pretty much significantly compared to from the uh, norm protection factor. Um, because these factors are fixed stable values that comes from the N529. But this is based on the conservative factors that we will use to, for our calculation to ensure um, uh, we are actually well protected. So for calculation, value discussion, we will always use the factor for maximum usage. Yep. Okay. I hope you, um, Michael has answered that question. Next question yep. is, uh, they asked uh, to clarify or to confirm, to clarify or to confirm whether it's mm -hmm. half mask or full face respirator with particulate or gas filter or cartridge must not be used inside confined space, question mark. But mm. if I if I'm welding inside a confined space, for example, mm. does this apply? Okay. Um I cannot confirm, but I mm. can be very pretty sure that as long as you are in the confined space, you are not allowed to use the full face mask with filters. But the, this welding part itself in a inside a confined space example, uh, inside a confined space, you are not allowed to use a full face mask with filter cartridge. The exceptional cases, what you have is that when you when inside the con you are inside a semi confined space, that means uh, the half tank is the back of the whole tank is actually really open and it's very well ventilated and you have installed what we call a gas monitoring devices in the combined in the area that can ensure continuously O2 available. So and you will set the lowest lowest limit of the O2 devices at 18 percent. Mm -hmm. So uh any uh slightly higher than the seventeen 
the same that we set as lower. So once you actually drop out to 80%, uh, you will actually escape immediately as the escape route itself. So that can be used as a potential for, for wearing a half mask with filters. But if there's no such warning or predetermined devices being installed in the confined space that uh, measure more concentration of O2 and lower concentration of O2, you definitely cannot use a mask and filter. But again, I must say this is based on determined, uh, based on uh, working conditions and the back end of the confined space. If it's open and well ventilated, if it's an enclosed confined space or a tank doing welding, you must not wear a mask and filter. You have to wear a supply air devices, uh, such as um, our airpack or SCBA to actually go into the confined space to do the welding. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, I, we shall try to attempt to answer the last few questions. Um, may okay. I ask if there's a table for OEL? Uh, if I am not mistaken, they are con constant. I'm not sure whether I read mm. the question correctly. May I ask if okay. there's a table for OEL? Uh, depending on the again, depending on the local legislation, they might have a table, but uh, it will be too big because there will be there are too many contaminants in the market. Uh. So OEL is the uh, operation exposure limit for all chemicals. So mm. uh, it will be a very huge list, even if there is a table. So usually for what I do, we do is actually I go to my Drago Voice, the website, and I'll just key in the gases, H2S, CS2, yes or any other, even carbon monoxide, I will actually get the OEL of the particular country itself. So just remember the OEL actually meant is the occupational exposure limit the maximum limit that you can expose during working. So this is where um, you will get your maximum, you will get the maximum value of the chemical that you are allowed to work with and it varies between different countries. So you, each country might have a table or Excel file in a way for, for you guys, but uh, we do have that record in the Jagger Boy, so you can visit our website to actually get the value if you know the few different type of chemicals that you are looking through. Yep. Okay, Michael, quickly. Uh, this question is asked, yes, uh, in a confined space, uh, we are not allowed to use full face mask with filter. How about half face mask with filter? I guess this similar. is similar nope. to the question. Okay. Yes. I think you have so answered. as long as the APR, you are not allowed. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you are actually uh, better to be safer to make sure that you have a proper Confined space uh, entry checks in place. Okay, maybe just add a few more questions here. Um, some filter has indicator. Do Draco yes. filter provide indicator? No. Okay. So um. Okay, this is actually a very tricky question. You really need to understand how um the end of service life indicator really works. Um, uh, there are a few different end of service life indicator uh, but what we commonly see in the market they only monitor organic vapors so how it works is actually there is a filter gauge line and once the active carbon in the filter being reacted with the organic vapors it will actually sense a, a reaction to the indication line but it will actually record at certain area of the cartridges so it always it's not a foolproof version in a way, from my own opinion. Um, and second, it's only available for very limited of um, chemicals, which I remember is around maximum around 30 chemicals. And you will need to know, you need to um, assess the site with uh, laboratory tests and submit this testing to the manufacturer that do the indicators on the filters to actually to check out whether are you able to use that as an indication or not. So based on this whole process and the reliability of having the indicators on the filters, um, we do not produce filters with indicators. Yeah, because the, the real 
reason is if that is going to use as a base of to indicate when you're going to change your filters, it it cannot be achieved, and it's not recommended. If we want to base that, and this is this indicator is only available based on NIOSH standards for organic papers, and even NIOSH standards itself mentioned you are not allowed to use the end of service time indicator as your base primary tool to indicate the change of the filter because they also understand the accuracy might be the first. Uh, thus, it's not the base recommendation. And we, if you're going to add on to our filters, we need to ensure it's a foolproof product. And currently, that's in the market, or I would say there's no way a filter can be correctly being measured when to change itself. So we will look, instead of having um, the artificial intelligence of a potential way, we still want to train our user to actually know and how to wear the mask and change it when required. So uh, do contact with Dragon salesperson and we will actually run through a series of uh, tra training if required, um, how to identify the case um, of chemical um, based on based on our filters and also doing on the pit test itself to ensure a full coverage of uh, APR protection. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Michael. I think that's the last question that we can. Uh, we're almost coming to the end of this webinar. We thank you for coming and joining us uh, today.